Hello everybody and welcome back to my channel. If you're new to my channel, hello, my name is Caitlin Ellie and today we are going to be talking about the oldest solved case that is now unsolved and it is the case of Lil Maria Ridolf. Not Rudolf, Ridolf. Remember that, Ridolf. So, she was born on March 12th of 1950 to her parents Michael and Frances Ivy Ridolf. She was a 17, seven year old girl back when the story took, takes place back in 1957. And she was the youngest of four children. She had two sisters and one brother. Her father, Michael, worked at one of the, at one of the Sy Sycamore, Illinois factories. And her mother was a homemaker. So a homemaker back in those days is just basically someone who you know, t cooked, cleaned, take care, took care of the home, basically everything that needed to be done. You know, that was all done by the female. The husband always went to work and, you know, just minded their own business, I guess. The kids always went to, were, went to school and it was actually very rare back in those days to see a woman that actually worked outside of the home. So it was an extremely, extremely rare case. So. Maria Ridolf's full name was Maria Elizabeth Ridolf. Like, that's, that's pretty. That's so pretty. At the time that she was abducted, Maria was seven years old. She was 44 inches tall and she weighed 53 pounds. I'm not sure how tall 44 inches is. Someone help me with that. I don't know. But she was an honor student. She was in the second grade. And she received perfect Sunday school attendance at Evangelical Lutheran Church of St. John. I know in the last video we were just talking about evangelicals and Lutherans and stuff, and I was like, nah, not the same, not the same thing, not the same thing. So, according to her mother, Maria was extremely high strung, which means she was very nervous, and if she was in any type of trouble, like if she had, you know, a bad grade or something, her parents yell at her, she would become hysterical, like just screaming and crying, and it was just awful. She was a screamer, according to her mother. She was just screamed a lot, and she was terrified of the dark. And her best friend at the time of her disappearance was an eight-year-old girl named Kathy Sigmund. Hi, Kathy. The crime begins. So the crime basically began on the evening of December 3rd of 1957. So this basically takes place, like, uh, two, three weeks before Christmas. Awful. So, Maria wanted to go outside because it was snowing outside. And she was like, yes, you know, snow. I want to go outside and play in the snow. You know, like, a lot of kids, like, that are... I mean, honestly, sometimes I even want to go outside and play in the snow. But, like, little seven-year-old girls and little seven-year-old boys, they, like, want to go outside and play in the snow all the time. So... She had begged and begged and begged, and her parents finally said yes. And she, they were like, yeah, you can go outside and play in the snow. It'll be fine. So both Maria and Kathy, once they were finished eating their dinner, Kathy Sigmund's the best friend, by the way, in case you didn't remember that. Kathy Sigmund's the friend. They went outside in the dark to play in the snow. So it's like pitch black outside, and they're like, let's go play in the snow, yes. And the parents were like, all right, see you later. Which honestly, like back in that day, like nobody was ever really worried about anything because it was the 50s. Not a lot of stuff like happened back then. You know, they felt safe in their little community and safe enough that like the kids could be outside playing before dark. And um, they ended up playing a game called Duck the Cars. So basically you have to like, every time you saw um, a car, you know, you'd run back and forth across the street. You try not to get hit by a car. You know, and try to avoid the headlights. And according to Kathy, this was the best friend. They were approached by a young man in his 20s. And this is when the night starts to take an awful turn. So according to Kathy, the man was tall, slender chin, had light hair, and had a gap in his teeth. Do need braces. Do need braces. <laughs> I'm sorry for laughing, but ugh. he was wearing a colorful sweater as well. So the man had said his name was Johnny. Johnny. That's such an original name. Like, what's your name? John. My name was Johnny. My name's Jeff. You know, just, ugh. 
And they told him, he told the girls that he was 24 years old and not married. Something that concerns me is like, I know back at the, back in like the fifties, like nobody was ever like worried about anything. But like, if I were like a parent of two seven year old little girls, like, or, or like a seven year old, and eight year old, sorry. And a 25 year old or 24 year old man walked up to my little girls and said, hi, my name's Johnny. Hi, I'm 24. You know, I'd be a little, like, creeped out because that's, like, super uncomfortable to that, like, to witness that. Like, that's so weird. And this Johnny dude asked them if they wanted a piggyback ride. They're like, hey, you guys like piggyback rides? I'll take you for some. My name's Johnny, you know? And it's just like, oh, like. Stranger danger, man. Like, not a lot of people taught their kids stranger danger back in those days, but... Oh, my. Oh, my. So... They said yes. They're like, yes. We would love to get a piggyback ride. They asked them if they liked dolls. And they were like, hell yeah, we like dolls. Now what's up? So, Johnny started to give Maria a piggyback ride, you know? And afterwards, she ran off to her house, and she went to go grab a couple dog dolls to show Johnny. You know, she's like, look, Johnny, my dollies, yay. And once Maria returned, you know, Kathy, she had run off to go home to get her mittens because she was starting to get really cold. She's like, look, I'm going to be right back. I just need to go grab my mittens. You know, it'll be a fantastic time. You know, I can just stay right here, and I'll be right back. I swear, I promise. I promise I'll be right back, you know. And she left Maria alone with this Johnny character, you know? And I don't know about you guys, but if I found out that a suspicious man that I've never met before was hanging around about just six and seven year olds, oh, no, seven, eight year olds, and the eight year old left the seven year old alone to go grab something with this man that they've never seen before and wanted to play with them. That's a little suspicious to me. I'd be like, oh, what the hell? Child predator alert. Then, this is when the story starts to take a deep turn. So, when Kathy had returned home, well, returned back to the street from getting her mittens, Maria and the dude were gone. You know, so she's like, oh, well, that's unusual. Like, I thought they said they would be right here you know when i would find them like what, what what's going on so kathy was like maybe she went over to her house so she goes over to the Rudolph family home and she says to the mother she's like look maria you know the seven-year-old she's missing i don't know where she is you know and family they have thought oh you know she's probably just playing hide and seek right she's just playing hide and seek so they sent Maria's 11-year-old brother to go look for her, right? So she's, she's like, okay, well, you go, you go find Maria and you bring her back into the house because I'm sick and tired of her playing these games, man. I'm just, I'm tired. Tired of it. So when the brother came back to the house, he didn't have Maria with him. He's like, look, I don't know where Maria went. She's not here. You know, I looked everywhere. I couldn't find her. So with... As soon as they found out the brother couldn't find her, they immediately just called the police. They're like, all right, well, if, you know, Timmy Sue couldn't find Maria, I actually don't know the brother's name, but I'm just gonna call him Timmy Sue for right now, couldn't find, you know, Maria, then there's something going on. There's something really wrong here. So within the hour, the police arrived to search for Maria and this Johnny character. You know, they're like, maybe. Let me just find Maria and Johnny. And the reason I'm saying Johnny is because it's, who knows if that's his real name. We probably just said his name was Johnny just to like play with the girls. Like, oh, my name's Johnny, Johnny Appleseed, you know? So it's just, that's, that's why I'm using it in quotations. I'm sorry I'm laughing. It's just uncomfortable situation here. So the police had thought that he approached the seven year old girls around between 6.30 p.m. And that Maria was abducted between 6.45 and 7 p.m. So it was kind of a late night for them to be outside playing by themselves. At least it's just my opinion. I wouldn't feel comfortable with my kids playing outside in the snow at 6.45, 7 p.m. at night. But 
Those were different times, man. Different times. So, because Kathy was the only witness to this Johnny abductor character dude, um, she was placed in protective custody because there was fear around the neighborhood that the Johnny dude will come back and take Kathy as well to be with Maria. So, they were like, look, I'm, I'm a little concerned here. So, they took Kathy to the police, to sta police station and... Um, they had a lineup of people. And the first person she picks out is... It, it was him. It was him. She points out a guy named Thomas Joseph Rivard as the man that they talked to. But there was only one situation with that. Thomas Rivard had an alibi. He was already in jail at the time of the kidnapping. So he couldn't have gone and taken Maria, right? Because he was in jail. He can't, you can't just go out of... Break out of jail, kidnap someone, and go right back to jail. You know what I'm saying? Like... You wouldn't do that. If you were going to break out of jail, you would want to be out of jail for a lot longer. You'd be on the run. These people would be looking for him. You know what I mean? So it, he was immediately ruled out. They're like, okay, cool. He's, he didn't do it. And they thought, you know, this guy does look like Johnny, but he looks like a little too old to be 24, 25 years old. He looks like he's like in his 30s, so... I don't think that's Johnny, all right? That's not Johnny. Johnny, no, no. And so Maria's abduction at the time had spread over national news. So both Dwight D. Eisenhower, who was the president at the time, and the FBI director were interested in this case. They're like, all right, let me, let me know what's going on. What's the tea? Spill the tea. What's going on with this Maria Ridolph case? Like, what's going on here? So... Law enforcement began to look into drifters, which drifters are people that would come in from different towns, you know, and they would just, you know, like, I, I guess you could say they were free spirits, you know, like free spirits back in those days. They basically just, you know, stayed a little bit in one town, went over to another town for a little bit, and, you know, just traveled everywhere, but only stayed in one place for like a little bit, not too long. So they looked into drifters and sex offenders they even looked into a local man who was known to give children piggyback ride piggyback rides but they de developed no leads which honestly the local dude that gave piggyback rides i'm sure like he seems a little suspicious if you know what i'm saying but i, I can't say anything because i wasn't around back when this happened back in 1957 i don't think any of us are really around back in 1957 to say anything i'm sorry i'm laughing <clears throat> so Maria's parents had appeared on live television and they were like just begging for their daughter's safe return they're like look please Maria is just a little girl please I need to have her back we need to bring her back just if anyone has her anyone has any information please just call us just let us know what's going on we need our daughter to be safe you know and I, I feel bad though like I all these missing like children abduction cases and stuff where like the kids go missing the parents get so upset and they're pleading for the um the help like i want to go and i want to help them personally and it's just like i can't help everybody but i have that type of a caring heart where i would be the first person there like if i saw someone was missing I'm like all right bet. let's go let's go find this person let's go like whatever what needs done i will help you i have there's been times where like Back when I was living home in Maryland, I had like a loose, there was like a loose dog that like ran into like our, like into our uh, yard. And you know, we were playing with the dog for a little bit and then the owner came up and you know, took their dog and we're like, oh my God, thank you for finding my dog. You know, like I'm the type of person would do anything to like find these, like do what I can to help. So yeah, police were asking for, you know, the public search to, the public's helped to help search for her. The parents had gone to television and radios, which is a big thing back in those days because televisions and radios were like ungodly expensive back in those times. So if you had those and you could go onto tel like onto um, the televisions and you could like say this type of stuff nationally, you know, people, big prominent people, you know, lots of rich people will be able to hear it and would want to help out as soon as possible. And, you know, there could be in it, something in it for them as well. So now we're going to get to, unfortunately, April 26th of 1958. So on April 26th in 19, 
58 in Woodbine, Illinois, which is nearly 100 miles away from Sycamore. There were two tourists that were looking for like mushrooms in a wooded area. So they were in the woods and they were just like searching for these mushrooms, you know, just, you know, how like when we were kids, we'd go pick flowers and we'd go walking in the woods, you know, just doing woodsy things, you know, like you wouldn't expect to see anything in the woods, minus maybe a couple deer and a bear, <laughs> but like nothing out of the ordinary. So these tourists are in the wooded area along Route 20 and they s stop because they see something and they're like, um, what is this? And they're like, oh, at first they think like, oh my gosh, it's like animal bones. Like what's going on here? So they go up to investigate and it turns out like they were not animal bones. And in fact, they were the re skeletal remains of a small child. Oh, that's awful. I'm so sorry, but like this, oh, I wanted to do this case because the plot twists in it are just insane. But the fact that a child just died or even went missing in general, it just, it hurts my heart. I'm not a mother, but I'm also an aunt. And I am an aunt to, you know, several small children around Maria's age, even younger. And it just, it, it makes me sad because this stuff does happen. And it's just, why? Why would anybody do this? Is what I'm trying to say. It's like, why? So, the small child's body only had on a shirt, an undershirt, and socks under a partially fallen tree. So, shirt, undershirt, socks, no bottoms, nothing. So, the state of decomposition decomposition of the body insist indicated that it had been there for several months so it could have been there for at least four months the body was identified as little seven-year-old maria ridolph based on dental records a lock of her hair and the shirts and socks that she had been wearing when she disappeared oh my god i couldn't imagine being her family and like finding out like oh my god my my child just died. My child has been found dead. Like that, that would hurt me more than anything in this world. Like that. Oh my God. That's awful. Awful. Oh, and all you parents out there, you know, like, oh, just keep a good eye on your children. Cause this type of shit happens and it makes me sick to my stomach. It's horrible. So no photos were taken of the crime scene, obviously, because it was a the coroner at the time, his name was James Furlong, he did not want the photos of a deceased child going around in the newspapers. Because at the time they used to publish, you know, pictures of the dead bodies in the newspapers. They're like, why? I'm not going to put a small child in there. That's horrible. You know, like it's, it's, it's hurt. It's not good. It's not good. The initial autopsy, you know, it didn't come up with the cause of death for Maria because of the way her body was decomposed. It had been decomposed for so long that it was just unable to find the cause of death. It's, and it was back in the 50s, so it was kind of, you know, a little, little bit more difficult to uh, figure that stuff out than it is today. So, let's get into the suspects. First suspect we have is John Tessier slash Jack McCullough. And wait till you hear this about this guy. Wait till you hear about this guy. Like, oh my gosh. So, I feel so bad for this. I feel so bad for John. Like, he's, he's, oh, poor guy. So, John Tessier was originally born as John Cherry on November 27th of 1939 in Belfast, Northern Ireland. And his parents' names were Samuel Cherry and Eileen Cherry. And Samuel Cherry was killed in the early stages of World War II. So, at this time, you know, World War II started, obviously, in... 1939 with the invasion of Poland back in September 1st of 1939. So when John Tessier's dad died, he was just a little kid, you know, he would have been anywhere between, you know, two to like six years old. He was young. And the mother, his mother's name was Eileen Cherry, and she served as one of the first female airplane spotters with the UK's Royal Air Force. Well, that, that's pretty cool. Like, you know, a lot of people can say that. That's pretty damn cool. So, 
he, the, um, the wife, Eileen Cherry, she had met, uh, Ralph Tessier, who was serving the United States 8th Army Air Force at the, and at Royal Air Force in Bovington, England. Eileen Cherry married Ralph Tessier in November of 1944. So they were like, all right, let's get married, you know? And this was, John was still a kid. So John was born. So this is going to be his stepdad. His stepdad's name was Ralph Tessier. So then he ended up taking his name, Tessier, instead of being John Cherry, he became John Tessier. Anyways, so after the war ended, Eileen and her son, John, who was seven years old at the time, they followed Ralph to Sycamore, where Ralph and Eileen had seven, six more children. Good Lord. Six more children after John. Whew. Good Lord. A lot of kids. So the Tessier home was in Sycamore County, and it was conveniently right around the corner from the Rudolph house where Maria lived, the girl who we're talking about, the girl who got murdered. And at the time, and um, John Tessier was actually expelled in high school for pushing a teacher. He was in the 10th grade, and they expelled him. He's like, ah, you push a teacher, get the hell out. You ain't coming back. And at the time that Maria disappeared, he was 18 years old and he was living at home because, and he was planning to join the U.S. Air Force. He was just like super stoked. He's like, man, I can't wait to join the military. This is what I want to do. And I respect it. I come from a military family. We, we're mostly Air Force. It's Air Force mixed with like Army and like a couple Marines too, but it's mostly Air Force and Army. So, <coughs> excuse me. On December 4th, investigators visited, visited the Tessier home. They're like, okay, let's go over here and let's talk to this John dude and let's figure out what the fuck is going on with this, Mar what happened to Maria. You know, like, it's, what, what's going on here? So they wanted to talk about John, get any information that they could. His half-sisters said that their mother had, this is all these years later, the mother had lied and straight up said that on the night that Maria was abducted, he was home. Which wasn't true. And the half-sisters testified in the court case about this. And were like, yeah, no, it's not true. He, he wasn't home. He wasn't home at all. So John Tessier had the same name and the same description as Ajani. He told police and FBI that on December 23rd, he was in Rockford, Illinois. He wasn't anywhere near Sycamore. He was in Rockford. And he's like, you know, I was here. I wasn't there. I was here. And Rockford, Illinois is actually like, hold on, let me see, what, 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 40 minutes away, <laughs> 40 minutes away from Sycamore. Sorry. I was like, I have to like make sure I understand what the hell I'm talking about because I'm getting myself all tongue tied and lost here. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm laughing. It's just so awkward and uncomfortable talking in front of a camera, but it'd be like that sometimes. He said he was trying to enlist into the Air Force and this account of what actually happened contradicted what John's mother had originally said. They're like, oh, shit, she lied. Someone's lying. Someone is lying here. And I don't know who the hell is going on. What the hell? What the hell is going on? And the first thing I thought was, why would the mom lie about her son being home when he wasn't? Just straight up say, you know, my, my son wasn't home. This is where he's at. You can call him. And they can testify against it. You know, that is exactly what the hell happened. So. John had apparently spent the day in Chicago, which is also in Illinois, in case y'all didn't know. Chicago, Illinois. And he had left his own car at home. He had, uh, there was telephone records saying that he was in Chicago, there was a call from the post office from John Tessier saying, hey, I'm in Chicago, what's up? And he had taken a train to and from Chicago and he left his own car at home. So he didn't have his car. You know, he had, he went to the train station. At least that's what he's saying. And the person had said his name was John Tessier as the operator had opened, wrote him down. He had wrote down John Tessier, they misspelled his name. Which, I mean, that's understandable, because if you're, like, saying, you know, Tessier, it can come off as Tessier, I guess, depending on how you say it, or your accent or anything. After he made the call, he went to Rockford Recruiting Office and dropped off his enlistment paperwork. He's like, all right, here you go. 
Which, in case you didn't know, in order to join the military, you have to drop off the paperwork and they have to review it. And it takes several more months for you to even, like, go off to basic. They'll give you a basic date. You know, you have to do all this stuff. I didn't even think he even went to meds, did he? So, John was brought into the police station to take a lie detector test, which he had passed with flying colors. And there was an officer. He still doubted this. He was like, mm, I don't know. It still seems pretty suspicious to me. It's pretty suspicious, you know. But he was still taken off the suspect list. They were like, okay, we rule him out. They proved he took a lie detect detector test. Said he wasn't he wasn't the murderer. All right, case closed. It ain't him. So now let's fast forward to 1997, and we're going to be talking about someone named William Henry Redmond. So in 1997, Sycamore Police. Lieutenant Patrick Soler named William Henry, Henry Redmond as the killer in the case. And he was like, oh, it's closed. It's him. We're closed. Bye. All right, let's go. We're done. And so let me give you some information about Pat, uh, Henry Redmond, not Patrick Soler. Patrick Soler is the police officer. Silly Caitlin. <laughs> he was a former truck driver and carnival worker from Nebraska who had died in 1992. Redmond was charged in 1988 with the 1951 murder of an eight-year-old girl. Suspish. He was also a suspect in the 1951 abduction of Beverly Potts, who was a 10-year-old girl from Ohio. I might do that case another time, but let me know what you think, if I show there or not, but that case is interesting too. And Redmond apparently told a fellow inmate that he had killed somebody in a similar fashion. He's like, oh, you hear the boy that Maria, uh, Maria Rudolph girl was killed? Yeah, I killed someone just like that. The same way, you know, and the so and Solar also, the police um, officer Solar, he believed that Redmond's behavior and his appearance matched that of Johnny. He's like, you're Johnny, man. You're Johnny. You gotta be. Well, Solar's report was criticized, and everyone was just like, "Yo, what the hell's wrong with this dude?" Because it didn't have any real evidence in it, pointing him, pointing uh, the finger at this William Henry, Henry Redmond dude. They're like, there's no solid evidence saying this was him. And because it didn't have any real evidence, it had, and had political motivations toward it, to put in jail. They tried, he used his political beliefs to try to put this Redmond dude, what was his name, William Henry Redmond into jail. Ain't that some shit. I, I'm sorry, but that Patrick Solar dude was just... He seemed like a dick. He seemed like a real dick. So the case went cold again for all these years later. And then, decades later, in 19, Jesus, 2008, the case was reopened. So while on his deathbed, while on her deathbed, Eileen Tessier, which was... Uh... I'm not sure if it's John's sister or his mother, but anyways, related to John, this person's related to John, said in January of 1994 that those two little girls and the one that vanished, John, did it. And this is quoted from her. You have to tell somebody, end quote. And so Janet, you know... Janet was like, oh. Janet Tessier is the daughter, I think, I believe. Janet is either the, the daughter or the sister. Assuming the situation from the statement that John Tessier had kidnapped and murdered Maria Ridolph. So they're like, oh shit, it was John? What? What? You know, like their minds are blown at this point. So, apparently, she had heard that Eileen had lied to investigators about John being home. So Eileen's the sister that had lied about him being at home. So, so Janet's like, Ooh, Eileen, you got some spalining to do. You want to film us out about lightning to do. So Mary Pat, which is another one of the sisters, and her older sisters, Eileen and Janet, suspected John as a murderer for years. They were just like, it, it, it's John. It's got to be John. It has to be. 
Eileen was a cancer patient and had was on morphine at the time that she's said this confession. And she was considered disoriented by the doctor. So they're basically saying, like, you know, Eileen has no idea what the hell she's talking about. You know, she's on these medications. She's all doped up. She's got cancer. You know, she don't know what the hell she's talking about right now. Which, honestly, I'm not joking about anybody having cancer. Cancer's terrible. I'm so sorry for any loved ones that are going through anyone having cancer in their family. That is horrible, horrible, horrible. And my thoughts and prayers are with you right now. Oh. Anyways, another woman had allegedly said that John Tessier had given her a piggyback ride as a child. This is the John dude. And he had refused to put her down. She's like, nope, nope, I ain't put you down, damn. Then, then the parents had to come outside and yell at John Tessier, put down my child, damn it. You know, and then the parents finally intervened. So Tessier, according to theory, could have kidnapped Maria and driven her to Rockford just in time to make that 6.47 p.m. call and meet up with the recruiters at 7.15 p.m. Because she had been kidnapped, according to police, no later than 6.20 p.m. So if he could have kidnapped her and drove all the way over to the recruiting station, gotten his stuff done, gotten ready for enlistment, he's like, oh, hell yeah, let's go. Then, oh, wait till you hear this. This just gets even more juicier. This gets even more juicier. Y'all, y'all pay attention to this. Tessier's former girlfriend that he had at the time of Maria's disappearance back in 1957 provided an unused military train ticket from Rockford to Chicago dated December 1957. Contrary to his alibi, he had not taken the train to uh, Chicago. Instead, he drove. He would be, And at the time, he would have had enough time to drive back to Sycamore on the afternoon of December 3rd, abduct Maria, kill her, and then dip right back to Rockford. Then, a high school friend of John's later recalled seeing a seeing John's painted car in Sycamore that afternoon. And he, John never let anybody else drive his car. He was like, what the hell? You ain't driving my damn car. The hell do you think this is? You ain't touching my car. Bye, Felicia. Mm. And in two, July 2011, the Seattle Police Department joined up with the Illinois State Police. They brought in John for a question. I'm, I'm not exactly sure why the Seattle Police Department got involved, but they did. Seattle, Seattle Washington and Chicago, Illinois are like super far away. Mm. Anyway, so... They brought in John for questioning back in 2011. At first he was like calm and collected. He was like, all right, cool. I don't know what the hell is going on. Then they brought Maria and he like refused to talk. He's like, look, I don't want to answer any more questions. I'm just done. I need to get the hell out of here. I'm just tired of this. Tired, tired, tired of this. So then they announced what Maria's cause of death was to the public. Maria's cause of death was caused by stabbings with a knife to her neck, causing her to bleed out and die. And I was like, God damn, ain't that some shit? Poor little girl. That's horrible. It really is. Imagine just like being a little girl, a little seven-year-old girl, wanting to play with your friends, and all of a sudden this person just kills you. Like, what the hell? So then comes the trial. The trial occurred in September of 2012. So this is really recent. This was like nine years ago from a 1957 case. The trial was nine years ago. The prosecution said that John McCullough was sexually attracted to Maria and decided to kidnap her, but ended up killing her. I don't know how the hell the jury came up with that. They're like, yeah, so he just abducted her and he wanted to have sex with her. Like, why would anyone... Like, when to have sex with a seven-year-old girl? Like, what the hell is wrong? Anyways, and Kathy Sigmund Chapman. This is the Kathy girl. The Kathy Sigmund who was there whenever Maria was abducted. This is the Kathy girl. She knows. She was there for everything. You on the money, girlfriend. You on it. And she had, you know, she walked up and she said, McCullough is the, it, he, that's Johnny. That is Johnny. I tell you, that's Johnny. That's the one who played with us back in 1957. And there were three inmates. Sorry, a bird just like flew by and like scared the shit out of me. I was like, Ugh. 
there were three inmates that were jailed with John McCullough, who's basically said that he admitted to killing Maria. It, but the problem is, though, whenever they were trying to tell, you know, what he was said, what he was said, what he had said to them, each story was a different damn story. It was so inconsistent, you know. They were just like, so what did he tell you? What did he tell you? You know, like, it was just awful. So one person said that John had strangled her with a wire. And another person said that she was smothered to death to stop her from screaming when the cause of death was stabbings anyway. So none of them knew what the hell they were talking about. They're like, okay, cool. They're, they're done. And then on September 14th, 2012, John McCullough was convicted of the murder and kidnapping of Maria Rudolph and was sent to life in prison. I know what you're all thinking. Case closed. It's done. He did it. He did it. He got arrested. They convicted him. He's he's the killer. He is that. And then it gets even wilder, my friend. Even wilder. Wait till you hear this shit. So, Richard Schmack. Schmack. I'm gonna smack you upside the damn head. Schmack. Richard Schmack conducted an extensive review of the evidence. He's like, let me just look through here. Let me just double check and make sure we got everything correct, right? So he's like, let me look, look, look. And he was like, now hold on a goddamn second. Something's a little fishy here, you know? Like, what the hell? Well, it turns out that John McCullough couldn't have committed the crime and was innocent and it could because there was evidence there that was kept out of the trial that clearly showed where he was at the day and time of Maria's murder that went along with John's alibi. He was 100% going and driving that car and he was going over to enlist in the military and everyone's minds were like what? What? I thought this was solved. I thought it was this John dude. Like, what the hell? So, there was also phone records that showed that John had made a collect call to his mom from the payphone in downtown Rockford, just like John had said. Way to go, John. Then, Based on the distance of the driving and the conditions, because they were, remember we said it, was, it had snowed a lot, right? They were outside playing with snow. So due to the fact that it was icy and it had snowed a whole fucking lot, there was no way that he could have made it there from where he was in Rockford down to Sycamore and killed Maria. There was no possible way. So... After all that evidence, after everything that happened in this wild ass story, McCullough, John McCullough, was declared legally innocent of the crime on April 12, 2017. Hallelujah. I knew he wasn't there to begin with. But, you know, it just, I, I honestly felt bad for the families because I was just like, first of all, Maria's family being told like, oh, this is him. He killed it. Just to find out all these years later in 2017, it ain't him. We fucked up. And then John's family having to figure out that their son had murdered a seven-year-old girl just to find out he never did it in the first place. I mean, what? Oh, my God. Well, talk about just an all-over-the-place story. Anyways, this unfortunately, the case is still unsolved. And it has been unsolved since 2017. And I would really like to see this case get solved. If anyone knows anything, please Please, please, please call the Sycamore Police. Please call the Sycamore Police. And that is the end of today's story. The solved, but the oldest solved case, which is now unsolved case of Maria Ridoff. Thank you all for tuning in to me today. And thank you. Comment below what you thought of this story. And then like, subscribe, share to your friends so they know also about the story so we can help get her story out there for everybody to hear. All right. Thank you guys so much. Bye.